hey there, gang. Something out of the ordinary has appeared. This case is smaller than those with which I usually deal. What could it be? Well, at least it has strings. You guys know I'm not a violin repair person. I like violins, but I would never promote the idea that I'm in with that crowd, because it's a whole different ball game over there. It's not that the disciplines are super far apart in terms of technique and skill set, but it's a specialty. The violin world is off on its own, it's kind of insular, they have their own way of doing things, the uniformity of the instrument design gives them kind of a head start because they can delve really deep. Um, they see the same thing over and over again. And one of the nice things is violins are designed to be taken apart. That's not something that happens in the guitar world. So they've refined their procedures based on that. I took this on from a client for whom I've done other work, and he knows I'm not a violin guy. There are precious few violin repair people around here. I'm always on the lookout for someone local I could send prospective customers towards. So far, I haven't found anyone. See, the thing is, this is a fiddle. Some violins get called that based on the music coming out of them at any particular time, but this thing is idiosyncratic enough that I'm pretty sure Vivaldi was never on the set list with this one. This is an actual barn find. It was in a barn. It's someone's great or great-great-grandfather's came off a farm in the breadbasket of America, where it had sat for decades. Um, it may be a catalog purchase from the teens or twenties. Perhaps some aspiring luthier put it together. I don't know enough to tell you that part of the story. Um, there might be an expert who looks at this and says, oh, I know what that is immediately, but you know, I'm not well versed enough. My depth of knowledge isn't there for that. But I have looked at enough violins to know that there's some weird stuff going on here. The thing that catches my attention first is the character of the edges. There's usually a gentle scoop or recurve effect. I call it the gorge in this area of the purfling here. But here it's just extreme. It's hard to show, but it goes up full sixteenth of an inch and fast. And the overhang of the top over the rims varies a bit from place to place, but it's also really wide in comparison to most that I've seen. Rather than the usual black, white, black purfling, there are lines of veneer that are pressed into this channel that goes around the circumference of the body. Here it seems to be just a single strip of dark brown wood. Could be dyed, could be walnut or rosewood. And see how the corners are akin to something you'd find on the working end of a cement mixer. They're really not by the book. Very unusual. Despite its age, it doesn't seem like it got a whole lot of play. Um, there's a trace of rosin on the body, but the varnish everywhere, and especially like on the back of the neck, it's all there. And also, the pegs have not worn in beyond, you know, the surface of the headstock. They're still looking just like they would have when they were originally fit up. So, you know, this thing was not played a whole lot. Here's the issue. The neck is loose. There's also a little break here under the heel, or the button as it's called in violin parlance. There's a crack in the tailpiece here that runs right through the E-string hole and up to the top here. Seems very dangerous and a potential liability. You tune it to pitch and it goes off and takes out the eyeballs of every kid in the room. What's that going to cost you? And it's also missing a little piece of pearl here. Not a structural issue, but it's noticeable. So the goal is to make it play. It's a family heirloom, but it should be functional. There's a bridge in the case, and that's the one we're going to use. To get this neck back into place, I might have to address its angle relative to the body. And the other thing is, this neck-to-body joint here is missing a supporting element, which is kind of important. Um, in most violins, there's an extension of the back that continues over the end of the heel. And that provides like additional gluing area at right angles to keep the neck from folding forward. I might have to make something. It's not going to be probably what you'd see in a high-end violin shop. I follow a couple of violin types on Instagram. Uh, Chris Jacoby, he posts amazing stuff. 
to be honest, I've been inundated with followers on Instagram lately in the last year, and I can't keep up. You know, I have this mental thing where I need to get through every post on my dashboard every day. So if you followed me and I haven't followed back, it's not that I hate you. It's just I got too much coming at me at one time. Let's prep some glue. When you're working on violins, it's going to be hot hide glue. There is no substitute. If you try and use a substitute, the next time you appear in public, several representatives of the Violin Society will creep up behind you and stretch your underwear over your head, an action sometimes called the atomic wedgie. If you're unlucky enough to fall into the hands of the Cremonese, be prepared for destruction de la biancheria intima. So, no tight bond. People ask about hide glue. It's not magical. Um, preparing it isn't too hard. It does have a fast gelling time, so you do need to have your stuff together and your clamps ready, and you've got to be in the right frame of mind before you start the glue up. Um, hide glue is basically unflavored jello. It's the same stuff. It's formulated to have different properties for different industries. The lower grades are kind of nasty smelling and looking. You know, they're very dark and like gravy. The high grade stuff is very clear and it's more refined. Um, it's sold in, it's sold by gram strength, which is an odd technical measurement. Um, they mix up a batch with a certain amount of protein solids in it, they gel it, and then they keep it at a certain temperature, and they measure how much force it takes to push, um, it's like a, like a plunger, basically, with a certain known diameter, how much it takes to push that into the jello to a certain depth and they express that in grams. So it might be 135 grams on the weaker side, and it goes all the way up to 512. 512 is very strong glue, but the gelling time also goes up with the number, so the strong stuff is really only useful for automated assembly processes, like when they're making cardboard boxes. Most woodworkers will use something in the 150 to 250 range. It gives you enough time to get things situated and clamped um, before it gels. I think this was 212. can't remember. It's been like 12 years since I bought it. Um, it doesn't ever go bad. If you keep it in a nice, cool, dark, dry place, it's fine forever. So you have to rehydrate it in advance before heating it up. To do that, I add water in a ratio slightly less than 2 to 1 by weight. You can do it by eye, and it will probably work, but depending on how crushed up the flakes are, uh, you might get a product that's too thin or too thick for your purposes. That's not the end of the world. If it's thick, you can always dilute it. If it's too thin, you have to let some evaporate, and, uh, well, when you're cooking it, you just concentrate it a bit, you like reducing a sauce. So I got six grams here. I'll add about 10 grams worth of water. This takes a few hours to fully rehydrate. I use a small glass jar because I don't need huge quantities. Baby food jar or something like this little mustard jar works well if you can find one. Once prepared you can put the cap on and store this in the fridge for a week or two. Some people will freeze it. I've heard arguments that that can degrade the glue, but the people I know who do it are very well respected. Um, violin makers or full-time repair shops often have a dedicated purpose-built glue pot for larger quantities of the stuff. I don't use it every day, and usually it's in small doses when I do, so I just, you know, I go with a double boiler setup. I'll show you that in a little while. The crack in the tailpiece has been glued together. I'll reshape it after doing some more filling with ebony dust and super glue. I'll flood it, put some dust in, and then I can get in there and sand it smooth. The glue joint between neck and body has completely failed, and it just slides out. You can see that this was not really a precision fit. There's a whole lot of glue that was packed in there to take up any space. Hide glue is not that great at gap filling. Um, I just need to clean these surfaces and see how they fit together. I decided to replace the inlay because it left a big hole, and it's been a while since I've done any pearl work. I assumed both seed pods, or whatever this motif is, were cut as mirrors of each other, so I taped on some tracing paper and drew it out. Then I glued it onto a piece of yellow pearl. A lot of pearl blanks for sale on the market are kind of warped, so it's often necessary to flatten one or both sides before proceeding. 
I used fish glue for this. Seems to work well. It sands off nicely afterwards. And in more complex pictorial arrangements where you have to fit one piece of pearl to another, you can just soak them in water and the paper comes off nice and cleanly. There is a thick and crispy layer of glue on both surfaces in the mortise here and on the tenon on the neck. And i got to get some of that off. Um, you can try and scrape it off with edge tools, but this stuff is so hard and crispy, it's not good for the edge. And uh, it can also sort of flake the wood off rather than um, just the glue itself. So what I'm going to do is apply some cold water to these surfaces and let it basically rehydrate that glue. It'll become gummy and gel-like and it'll be easier to remove I can cut it free. Just got to put a little water on there and let that soak in for a few minutes and then probably come back and do it over again. And then maybe 10 or 15 minutes it'll be soft enough to remove more gracefully. There's also a piece of soundboard here along the base edge which I do want to remove and replace so I'll get some water in around that as well that'll help soften things a bit while the water soaks in I'll show you these most of my violin knowledge comes from a series of self-published books by a gentleman named Henry Strobel he came out with these in the 90s they're very homespun um, he ran a shop in Oregon, and basically these are like his notes and procedures mixed with reminiscences and bits of trivia. Um, this one's especially good for people who are not violin repairers, who find themselves doing violin repairs from time to time. Useful measurements for violin makers. It's got a series of charts and diagrams and standard measurements that you would expect to find on all the various uh, violin family instruments. Uh, mixed with other stuff. Um, he also made a video to accompany his cello making book, which I've got. And it's essentially a series of YouTube videos from 10 years before YouTube. You know, he was filmed by his wife or his kids with, you know, VHS cam. And it's, it's a very home movie kind of thing where there are parts that are left unedited. You know, all right, honey, I'm going to start carving here and end up here. Make sure it's all in the frame. And here we go. But, you know, it underscores for me just how much information is now available with one click to you guys. Because you're seeing more in a day on YouTube than was available at all before 2006. 25 years ago, if you wanted to watch a violin maker at work explaining things as they were being done, that video was it. And you paid a lot for it. Okay, I can start to remove that excess glue. Now it's more chewy rather than glass-like. So it does come off without dulling your chisel. I sort of scrape it or cut it off. The fit between neck and body is actually eh, pretty good as far as these things go. I mean, it wasn't chalk fit at the factory. I just want to make sure the angle is something close to normal, which it is. Here's my heating setup. It never boils. That would be bad. The temperature you want to keep it at is around 145 degrees Fahrenheit or 62 degrees Celsius. I try to let it come up to temperature slowly, you know, because like any food, there's a carryover effect. You could rush it and bring it to 145 really quickly, um, but you wouldn't be able to control it. It would keep rising and, you know, getting hotter and hotter. Um, the mechanical glue pots designed for this have sort of a zone you just sort of set it and forget it. You know, once you dial it in, it's good forever, but uh, in this case, you know, this is one and done for me. I'm just going to take the glue out and put it on the violin, and it's not going to be cooking here all day, so it's not so critical. You can see that it's now very liquid. Also test it out a bit. You want it to sort of dribble off the brush in a stream. I got glue on both parts, then assembled them. There's a dovetail effect here, so I just held them for a few minutes to allow the glue to grab, and then left it overnight. The geometry turned out satisfactory. Could be like half a millimeter low. I replaced the broken piece of soundboard and glued that back in its spot. I'm going to cut the replacement inlay piece, so I'll put a fresh blade in my saw. Pearl eats through these really quickly. Uh, this one might be a little bit coarse, but I think it's fine for this shape. There's nothing to this except taking your time.
I'll refine the nooks and crannies with small triangular files. Test fit looks okay. There are spots that need fill, so again, I'll do that with ebony dust and super glue. The old timers would have used dust and mastic, which is a natural resin. Then I'll file and sand to blend the two surfaces together. I'll pencil in the design for engraving. This tool is called a spit sticker. It's actually made for wood engraving, but it works fine for this too. It's actually technically scrimshaw, I guess, because I'll be filling the lines with India ink and then buffing off the excess when I'm done. I don't know what this design is. It's I've, When I first saw it, I thought it was a pineapple, but then I realized, no, it wasn't. It's just some kind of fluffy looking seed pod. Here goes the ink. I'll let that dry. Wipe off the excess. You can polish it up to a nice shine. That yellow is the natural color of the pearl. I didn't tint it with anything after the ink. Just got lucky. And now we come to the button. You can see that this back has been cut out to receive this little bit of molding on the heel. I think the edge detail on this violin was cut with a router, actually. I'm going to try and dovetail a piece into the back and over the heel to mimic the traditional design and give it more support. I need to cut away the molded bead on the heel so there's enough support that I can lay the dovetailed piece on there and trace it. I'll use my scalpel for that, for a nice thin line. After chiseling out the waist, it goes in there pretty nicely. Get some glue in there. You can see that it connects the interior neck block, the back, and the heel together and I'll clamp that up. Then comes the delicate operation of trimming the heel to shape. This is something I have practice with from the heel caps on classical guitars. You get used to cutting against the grain and not into the heel or the side. I'll carve and scrape the inlay piece so it flows with the contours of the body and its weird edge treatment. People will ask about the convex radius scraper. It's made by Pax. I got mine at Lee Valley not a sponsor. I'll paint on some yellowish tinted shellac to mimic the base ground or undercoat that you find on most violins. I'll lightly scrape it and go in with more brownish tones over top. This instrument has an extremely thin spirit varnish finish, meaning it's primarily shellac um, and there's not much on there. I'll also darken the gorge area a little bit to blend in with the surroundings. With the strings on, I can see that the action or string height is really super high. And the feet of this bridge don't conform to the arch of the soundboard. It's like it's never been touched, really. I worked these down using carbon paper to show the contact areas to be removed and carved away and reduced its height a little bit overall. And no, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time sculpting the bridge. Someone on um, Instagram took me to task when I posted a picture of this. I don't have a lot of experience with that and it might at some point find its way to someone who is more practiced. I wouldn't want to remove too much, you know, ruin it for them. But I did take a little bit of excess mass off. The original string spacing had been kind of carefree. I used the fiddle profile, which is slightly flatter and got the spacing more regimented. Notched out for the strings. Well, I was tuning it to pitch, and the high string didn't want to go any higher than E-flat, so now I've got to go and buy a replacement. These strings were essentially brand new, and had like only seconds worth of playing time on them, so we're trying to reuse them. I'm only going to buy a single, because you guys who aren't into violins wouldn't believe how expensive strings for these things can be. Alright, I think that was enough work. I'm going to call it done. I know one of you is going to turn around and tell me this is a lost Guadagnini that hasn't been seen since before World War II, but I'm not going to believe you. I think the inlay doesn't look out of place. Seems alright. And little heel button graft is doing its job. And if nothing else, it's far closer to an average string height. Much easier to play. And now, the Chacon from Johann Sebastian Bach's second partita in D minor. Hey.